obviously, we've got a setup that's different than normal. We've got our orchestra that's going to be doing this, um, this tremendous performance uh, here in a few days. And uh, so thus, they've been practicing and getting it all together. But for those of you who are out in the hallway and in the foyer, come on in. And uh, how are you guys been doing? You guys been doing good? That's what I'm hearing. That's, that's what I was hearing. And um, it's, thank you. It's, it was great. It's great to be back. It was great to be gone. Um, no, it was really super time. Uh, Lisa and I uh, had some time together and it was just a great experience. And, um, and then we ended uh, our time there in Oxford, England, and we had a chance to speak uh, three different times, and it was just precious to see the brothers and sisters there in England. Um, I was impressed. I was impressed with the people. I was impressed with, uh, though the churches are small, they had a great passion for the Word of God, and it was amazing. I want to thank all of you for being such incredible prayer warriors and just By you attending church, you have no idea how many people came up to us and crying uh, that that they took this church, they adopted you as as their church online because they couldn't meet. And England had shut down pretty hard. You were actually, uh, you know, you would report your neighbor. Uh, if they went out front, you're only allowed to go to a store, uh, one of you, not husband and wife together, one of you only could go to a store twice a week, and it was really hard. And um, But so many people came and said, I got saved, or my faith was restored, or our marriage was spared uh, during the COVID time because you guys were open, and so... Uh, I just want to thank all of you because uh, we, we, all, we have all been doing this and we'll continue to do this uh, together. So guys, let's do this tonight. As people are making their way in, let's let them make their way in, even though after we get started because we know that there's some traffic issues and stuff, but um, we want everybody possible to hear what, what might be the most practical happening now that we've ever had. And we're going to explain why that's true in a moment. So by way of introduction, I want to uh, let you guys know, though you probably already know this by now, but for the next 90 minutes, you're going to hear someone who uh, is not stopping by to just have us be one more person on their speaking circuit. That's not happening. We're not one more book stop for him. That's not happening. But what is happening is that a man who has decided a long time ago, five decades ago, to put Jesus first and to share Christ first above all things. So why is that important to a happening now service? Because we can talk all about what's going on in Iran and Syria and Russia and China and in America. We can look at all these various biblical issues and we will do that in time, but not tonight. Because tonight it's going to be about the most important thing regarding all of that. You know, we can get so bogged down in studying Bible prophecy that we forget to do anything with it. Right? We can get so excited about, oh my goodness, look at this, look at that, that we don't put anything into action or practice. And you guys know that Jesus is a man of action. Our God is a God of action. That none of us in this room is interested in theory. We're interested in actually living out our faith. That God is real, he loves us, and he created us for a purpose. He's the ultimate design engineer for why you live. And tonight, as we go through 
this amazing interview, you have got to make sure that you determine tonight to leave this building a changed person because you will be challenged. And um, part of that challenge I've watched happen when I have traveled with this man, when I've been places with him. He really does what he talks about. I'm talking about the Billy Graham uh, recipient award in evangelism. He started um, making a small family business that started in 1901 that just chugged along that by the time it came to him, he decided, let's, we got a product that's good enough. Uh, let's, let's take it to the world. And he received a lot of pushback on that. You would think that's a businessman, right? Dream come true. Let's, let's go for it. Uh, but it didn't go over well. And so uh, he did it really on his own. And uh, he has created a global business. He's an icon in this field of really automotive, can I call it beautification? Uh, in your garage or in your house, you probably have... Maguire's Auto Wax or Maguire's Treatment and that is Barry Maguire's world and God has blessed him but uh, he would say right now Jack no that's not my world Jesus is my world and that's a fact so listen give a warm welcome tonight to Barry Maguire Alrighty. So listen, you guys, before we get going, uh, he's written a book. This is that, that, there's that iconic. All the guys know this. Do any ladies in here know this? All right. But um, he's going to share, and he's going to share a lot. And so you're going to hear him talk a lot. I just want to remind you, he's got his latest book, his newest book that is out. And uh, I think there's 300 copies out in the foyer. Barry, I think you'll be there after. Tonight. I reckon so, yes. And um, that's going to be tremendous. So you guys, let's give it to God right now. Father, we pray that you'd bless our time together. And Father, that there'd be a profound <clears throat> exhortation that comes out of what Barry has to say. There are so many ways that people could look at him and say, well, how can he relate to me? But Lord, I know his story. Many in this room know his story. But Thank you that tonight many will know his story. And his story is, in fact, Jesus Christ. So, Father, bless our time together now, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, Barry, let's dive into this. Because um, as we look, as we consider your book, 26 chapters, um, in a very, very powerful book. But the most important thing is Ignite Your Life. Ignite's been a big theme about your life. <laughs> and uh, how did it all get started? How did you get started? Oh, well, if you talk about sharing your faith, I, I, not too many of you have been sharing their faith every day for 50 years. <laughs> Karen and I have been doing that every day for 50 years. And um, it, it really started back when, um, in the first days of our marriage, and uh, we were well churched and Sunday morning, Sunday night, and volunteering for everything and giving and all the stuff we did with that. But we didn't have any joy. Um, we had happiness, but we didn't have joy. And it seemed like the more we volunteered, the, the less joy we had. And we kept saying, this doesn't make sense. God, I mean, where are <laughs> what's yeah. going on here? So we started praying for joy. And uh, we went to a banquet. I was sitting uh, placed right next to the speaker of the day, who was, whose name was Herb Ellingwood, who was at the time, I'll give you my, my age now, he was the legal affairs secretary for Governor Reagan. Governor Reagan? Yeah. Oh, those were the days. Oh, yeah. And uh, I was anxious to talk to him about Reagan. Do you really pray in his office and all that? And so I got up. I had about an hour before he spoke. And in that hour, he never mentioned Reagan, and I never thought of Reagan, he, he went from one story to the next laughing and crying and laughing and crying. And, and then I was on a plane, and last night I was in this restaurant, and he was just out of his gourd, excited. He had joy. <laughs> and uh, I walked away from there, Karen and I both did, and I was in tears. And I said, That's, I want that. 
I, I, I want wow. what Herb has. When I get to heaven after seeing my daughter and, and our loved ones, I'm going to make a beeline for Herb Ellingwood and tell you how he changed a, a young guy's life way back in those days. He wouldn't even thought about it. And you never do. You don't know. You invest in somebody, you don't know where that's going to go. Uh, but from there, we started sharing our faith. And uh, in three years, we were sharing our faith a lot and thinking we should go into full-time ministry instead of our business. But the business, I'm the, I'm the third generation leader of the business, and we're alone doing about seven, dollars $800,000 worth of business, a small business. And I knew if I left, it would fail. Hmm. And so I prayed the most earnest prayer, literally the most fervent prayer of my life, prayer of my life that day and said, God, if you want me to go into full-time ministry, I will do it. I will do it. I promise you I'll do it. But I, I need to know that that's what you really want me to do. And I said, you almost have to speak to me in an audible voice is what I said to him. Mm. And, and not 20 minutes later, a guy by the name of Dave McNutt walked into my office who I didn't know. I knew him from church. I knew he's a missionary kid my age. He grew up in Africa, but I never had, never exchanged a glance with him. And he walks in all smiles, hi, where I was in the area, thought I'd stop by and see how it's going, what's, what's happening. And so I thought, well, he's not interested in cool cars and shiny paint finishes. So I started sharing, uh, you know, faith-sharing stories. And he said, wow, God's given you a wonderful ministry here, hadn't he? And I said, well, wh why would you say that? <laughs> he said, because a minister can't reach the people you're reaching, but as yep. a businessman, you can. And he gave me these words. Now, this was in uh, 1976, okay, almost 50 years ago. He said, your business, your pulpit, and it is because a pastor can't reach the people you're reaching, but as a businessman, you can. And he just said, it just makes so much sense that you're here. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I got to tell you this prayer I just prayed not, not 20 minutes ago about whether I should go uh, into full-time ministry or not. I said, it has to speak to me. And he said, well, that makes complete sense. I said, why? He said, I, I just dropped missionaries off at Orange County Airport. I was driving up Red Hill, and God spoke to me and said, go see Barry McGuire. Wow. And, and I, argued with him all the way to, I, I argued with him all the way to, to your office saying, I don't know this guy. I, I, don't, I don't know what kind of business he's in. I can make a fool of myself, but he would not let me go. Can you imagine? I mean, he just... When God wants things to happen, he knew our hearts. He knew that I was about to make a big mistake. If I'd become a pastor, I would have been a horrible pastor. I'm, I'm a businessman. Thank God that he didn't let me go, go into the pastor. But your That's car, how it all started. But your car would have been very shiny. Oh, yes, of course. Of course, yeah. <laughs> so the business the business had been i mean generationally your grandfather your father yeah, and selling body shops and car you know we're buffing cars I, what, the way i sold the product i think out of college was i would go into body shops and car dealers and buff with an electric buffer and that's how we sold Just our product to show that was our entire business and god inspired me to go retail and, so um, you're doing this and this is your tent making the the book of acts would, would call it your tent making skills uh, if any of you out, out there are young, you need to know something. Oh, I want to be involved in ministry. That's great. But know this, that uh, according to the scriptures, everybody involved in ministry had a tent-making skill, meaning that they had a, a, an ability to make income, right? They, they, were not, um, they were not entitled into the ministry. So here's Barry, uh, now the third generation taking this business, that began, that started out waxing or treating uh, carriages, wasn't it? The I, actually, before that, by, by the, the, it was a limitation on uh, car wax sales back in 1901. So my grandfather was doing furniture polish. Furniture and polish. And he was obsessed with, he wasn't a chemist, and he was selling a furniture polish. Nobody liked it. He decided to create his own. He said, God, help me create a finish that, that creates a perfect finish on black lacquer furniture. That was, that was his passion. And God gave him a very unusual mix of ingredients that helped him to accomplish that goal. He was in Evansville, Indiana. Over half of the horseless carriage manufacturers were in the state of Indiana. And without his permission, people started taking his furniture polish and putting it on carriages. And his product became a carriage polish without him doing anything exactly. about it. Right. All right. So it was a miracle from the very beginning. Then he moved to California in 1913. And um, then by the time uh, the end of World War II, car guys came back from the war. They knew how to build engines faster, make cars sleeker. They started doing things with their cars, and they wanted a great paint finish. 
So they go to their custom painters and, and get, spend a lot of money for these paint finishes and they, all the painters were using our products. And so in the next 10 years, 20 years, basically every painter in the country was using McGuire's products on the professional side. They're all retail now. They're all wanting to keep this finish looking this way. And they would get, the painter would give them a bottle of our polish and say, just use McGuire's on this finish. Nobody knew us. We had no advertising program. Isn't that but basically, every car guy in the country was aware of McGuire's products. And I found this. I traveled across country. And they, they told me how they found out about our products. They said, why aren't you in retail? So then God inspired me to say, we, you need to go retail. And then the family was against it, and that's a whole other thing. It was, it was, it was, it was a civil war back home. But uh. isn't that something? <laughs> and so, uh, need, needless to say, it's gone global. It's been global, and and so with all of that, somebody might say from from the viewer side, well, you're Barry McGuire, and you have had a life uh, of of uh, supply and privilege and care and. <laughs> and niceties <laughs> nothing could possibly yeah, you got a great smile course. on your yes. face what could possibly have ever gone wrong in oh his my. life i mean oh we're talking my. about sharing jesus it must be easy for this guy to share christ i, I was in a family business was buffing cars and body shops okay uh, karen my lovely wife karen 60 years married where are you karen right here in the front row this is this is our story but she's the extrovert. She loves everybody. You know, if you, if you hung around here, what she'd know her all your names. And we would go into business settings always. I mean, continually having to build the brand. And I would literally hide behind her. Now, you, you do know this is hard for us to do. No, I, I would hide behind her. She'll tell you. And she would start the, the conversations. And once she had it going a bit, then I would pop out and say, I'm her husband. <laughs> <laughs> And for years, she gave me $5 a week to live on. That was that, was, I that mean, much. That was, that was the case. So, no, we had a, we were a struggling little business, family business, lots of problems within the family business and, and different parts of it. You just read the book, you, you figure that out. But, uh, yeah, it was a whole different world. Um, but you know what? When you, when you start sharing your faith, you step into all the promises of God. And we'll get to these in, in a few minutes, yes. I suppose. But all of a sudden, he just gives you great confidence that changes your life. It just changed your life. And, and I look at it, we're all called to share our faith. That's right. He didn't say, we you know, all. go into the world, all you who have certain personalities, <laughs> right? Uh, right. Or, or, or you've been trained or you're paid or whatever. He just said, go. And notice he didn't say, go in the world and read the Bible. That's true. And he didn't say, go in the world and pray. No, we're all called. Yes, you know, I right. often say all of us are witnesses. Some of us are witnesses for the prosecution. <laughs> we, you know, we push people in the wrong direction. We got to stop that. We, we sometimes don't even know that. You go in the restaurant, and you make a lot of noise, and you talk about God. And the, the waitress on Sunday would rather be home with her kids, mm. but she's got to wait on Christians, and they're more demanding, and they stay longer than they should, and then they stiffer on the tip. What did they do to that waitress without even realizing they're going out? They had a great day, and they don't know. They just push that waitress. The Christian oh, should be, God. that's right. So you got to be looking, people are watching you all the time. We are a city set on a hill. People are watching us. And so that brings everything into submission. So you start doing it because you, you want to do everything you can to get as many people into heaven as possible. Yes. And the amount of time we have left. So that's you guys, <laughs> you guys, um, the first time uh, Barry and I ever had lunch together was in, um, I think you picked me up at the airport. We were in. Flags, or not Flags, oh, Dallas. Scottsdale. Wasn't it Scottsdale? Oh, it, could, it could have been. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Regardless, we sat down, we, to, we've done stuff. Regardless, <laughs> we sat down to eat at a restaurant, and uh, the hostess came up, or the server came up, and was taking our order, and everything was just squared away. Before she started to walk away, Barry and Karen both said, uh, mm -hmm. we're people of prayer. We, we love to pray. Is there something we can pray for you for? Now think about how simple of an invite that is. And the girl paused for a moment. You thought her answer was going to be no, but she started to think and she said, well, yes. And she began to share her story, her yeah. need right at yeah. the table. Yeah. And that door just opened up. All because they saw, she saw, Barry and Karen caring about 
her life. And so when you ask someone, is there something I can pray for you for? And I love how you you can even say, you know what? We are a people of prayer. We're going to pray over our meal here in a moment. I know you're busy working. Is there something that we can pray for you for? That just begins, as you so greatly say, it's a trademark of yours, is moving someone closer to Jesus every day. Move everybody every day. Move everybody, everybody. That's everybody. Get that? You get you, it starts in the kitchen, in, in the bathroom in the morning, all right? I mean, I can look at Karen sometimes and say, I think I didn't just move you closer to Jesus for that last comment. <laughs> it's everybody. You move everybody every day closer to Jesus. Uh, we're getting some cop-outs from the book, and people are just, they're, they're just doing the steward, the, 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 the waitress person, and nothing else. They think they've accomplished it. Yeah, true. Well, that's just, that's you just know, once or twice a day you have that opportunity, but you have opportunities. You're, you're with people. Continue. Everywhere you go, you're with people, and 80% of them are lost. Yeah. And, and we try not to. We don't necessarily say we're people of prayer. We're godly people. <laughs> we, 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 re, we just take it as casual as we can. We say, you know what? We're a bunch of crazy Christians. We, we, we just say different things. like, this. And we're going to pray for a meal, and we always ask our server. It's yeah. not just you. We always ask our server, is anything we pray for you? And you know what? We're finding out almost everybody has, prayer, has needs today. And, and that all of a sudden takes the, the pain out of it. All of a sudden, oh, and more than half the time. More That's than right. half the time, they'll give you, an, and usually an emotional yeah. answer. It's just, it's just crazy. Well, what you are so uh, prolific at doing and promoting is evangelism from the believer. A lot of people will think, well, look, he won the Billy Graham Award, so I didn't. Uh, that's his thing. But no, the scripture says, Paul told Timothy that we must do the work of an evangelist. Oh, yeah. <laughs> which means that every talk. single one of us need to be ready to share uh, when that door opens. And God, I believe that God will bring every day someone across your path of life, that it's built in, that God builds that in. But as a pastor, my burden, my heart is, oh, God, please, may they go out and do what was just taught. I mean, that's my big thing. It's kind of like, I would imagine somebody cooks a big meal and then people come and they don't eat it. It's like, what? As a pastor teacher, you want people to take in the word and then go do the word. And yet that's part of making disciples. But the disciple, as you said, is to go. Chuck Smith said years ago, healthy sheep produce healthy sheep. Yeah, I remember that. And so... To, to take the word of God and to do it must have, must incorporate evangelism. But people hear the word evangelism, they get scared. Oh, nobody wants to evangelize. So tell nobody us, wants tell to us. be evangelized and nobody wants to evangelize. Just forget that term altogether. Instantly, about everything you've been taught about evangelism, if you want to use that term, is wrong. Uh, you show me a verse in the Bible that says you're supposed to to memorize and recite stuff and the key points. And all that. It's not there. And, 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 and quite frankly, when you're talking to people, you can't orchestrate what they're going to, what, what you need to say. There's no way you can pray. You're talking to somebody and all of a sudden, in fact, their son committed suicide last night mm-hmm. or their wife just walked out on them or they just found they had, you have no idea where it's going to go. That's right. So you have to get away from the, from the, from the class. I appreciate evangelism programs. Karen and I went to several of them. They helped us. I, millions of people have been saved by evangelism programs. But most of us do not go to evangelism programs. Then we feel we're not entitled. The fact of the matter is you don't need to do anything but love. He said, they'll know you're my disciple by your love. So just love on everybody. Everybody touch them. Look them in the eye. If nothing else, just say, hey, have a good day. And, and God bless you. And look, in the, look them in the eye when yeah. you say that. And, and you'll be surprised how many times they'll tear up by you just telling them God loves you. So every day is an adventure. I mean, every day is an adventure. You walk into a room, it's like, what does God have in store for me now? And you have no That's idea exactly where it's going right. to go. But it's, it's, it becomes so much fun to see how God brings people into your life and and, and then he gives you the words to say. Mark 13, 11, it says, don't prepare. Don't prepare. Stop preparing. <laughs> Luke 12, 12 says the Holy Spirit will give you the, the words to say. It's amazing. So when you do that, there is no other way to have 
the intimacy with God. Folks, hear me on this. There is no other way. I convince there's no other way to have intimacy. We can have all this Bible knowledge. We all yeah. are educated way more than we deserve. Yeah. We have all this stuff, we get, but, but we're not applying it. And if we don't apply it, it's dead and useless. We need to do something with what we're being told. So when you, when you do that and you use it, then all of a sudden God's speaking through you and, and you see the change in the person right in front of you and you walk away and say, God, just use me. I pedal, I pedal car wax. <laughs> and he just used me to change that life. And it puts a bounce in your step. I got to tell you, it's like, it's, it's exciting. And we have that experience every day. If you say, why, why are you so joyful? You know, they often say, to Kara, why are you so happy all the time? You always have joy. You always have, man, we're just coming off one of those experiences. And we know another one's coming up. And guess what? Nobody's having to tell us to get into the word. We're digging like crazy. We're in, you're in the game. You're praying. Everything's working. Everything's working. And when you do that, then he takes your business or whatever your profession is or housewife or parenting or whatever and he turns, makes it, turns it all into good. And we'll get to that scripture in a minute. That's yep. the fact. Yeah, that. absolutely. <laughs> so it, uh, the, the joy. So uh, you've known the Lord. My whole life. Yeah. I, 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 many uh, generations of both gen- sides of my family. I accepted the Lord when I was 14. But I, but gen- I, yeah, I grew 14? up in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, all that. So one of the great things about, and you, you know this, one of the great things about being around a new believer is that they act like Barry. <laughs> is, is that they're so excited to tell somebody, right? And you love being around a new believer because they'll just, the overwhelming uh, relationship that they immediately have with Jesus is so real that some more, what's the word, more refined believers get a little nervous around a new believer because it's like, calm down, will you? Well, God delights in the passion that that new believer has. It's a new love. It's when you, it's, it, it's true in life and it's true with God. And you say, well, wow, you know, I'd like to have that. Well, if you'd really like to have that, then you need to get back to that first love relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, we all know this, book of Revelation, God says so. To return, to get back to that first love relationship. Why? Here's a man who has walked with Jesus all his life, and when he was influenced by that man to just put Christ first in everything and tell people, it keeps you and I, the older believers, Mm. in that fresh Mm. new place Mm. where Mm. it's thrilling all the time. And all of us are called to different things. What you do with your skills, those have been given to you by God. But you can use those skills no matter what it is. Somebody might say, well, I'm a a, a lineman for the Edison company. What can I do? Well, you're not the only lineman there. There's somebody else there. There's something to share. And once you do that, because you know when you do it, people, when you begin to share, when you decide, I'm going I'm to tell that guy about Jesus, the first thing that happens is your throat goes dry, your tongue starts to shrivel up, your heart rate increases, and I'm just talking about me. I don't know about you, but it's true. It's not natural because it has to be supernatural, okay? What Barry is saying is, let God be God. Just let God be God. And if this, imagine just in this room tonight, if, if we took Barry's example and challenge tonight, because you, you're going to be challenged tonight, to do this tomorrow, by the time we meet up on Sunday, mm. well, I'll be able to tell, oh, you'll, be, you'll be the ones <laughs> glowing at the Sunday service, because that's exactly what happens. There's something about what you know, but when you repeat what you know to others who need to know it, That's when you light up. I think that's why teaching is one of the great things, no matter what you might teach, if it's engineering or design or art. When you know it, then you teach it, you see the excitement of it, it reciprocates. It's it's remarkable. Yeah. And um, so, Barry, you have... Let me get get a comment on that just for a second. I don't want to interrupt you at all. Can I jump to you just for a minute? Well, think of the new Christian. The most aggressive, most vociferous uh, face shares are new Christians, Right? And, and they've never had a class. 
<laughs> they don't know scripture. But they do have God as their first love. They've just been saved. They realize, if they're really saved, they realize God just saved them from hell. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And they're very happy about as, that. As they can't wait till I was saved. Yeah. I was blind and now I see. They got this excitement. We're not supposed to lose that as we go on. That's, That's right. Not, that is not God's plan. That's right. It's just not. So when, when you, in, in the in Revelation chapter 2. Yep. The letter of the church, we've been, Karen and I have been to all seven of the church, but the letter of the church of Ephesus, he says, he's talking to us, Christians. Yep. He, I know you go to church. I, I know you give generously. I know you do a good teaching for bad. He's talking about us. He's, but I have this against you. Mm. You've left your first love. And you're no longer doing the first work. And then you know what he says to the Christians? He says, Repent. Yes, he does. I, 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 I have no way to say it. The pastor should be saying this, but I'm just quoting scripture. <laughs> He's telling Christians yeah. to repent. That's exactly right. <laughs> and return to your first love. Okay? There's mm. some of you in this room tonight that need to do that. What you, what you love, what you're excited about, you talk about. Whatever it is. If you had a great hamburger last night, you're probably talking about it today. <laughs> right? Whatever you're excited about. So if you're not talking about God and you're going through the motions, I got to tell you, God is no longer your first love. That's right. You've left your first love. But he's saying to all of us, repent mm. and come back to me. That's, 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 that's a that, serious message. That, that, <laughs> that first love, yeah. Yeah. That, um, when, when we have lost that first love, things mm. of of faith become atrophied. It's as though yeah. like a muscle's not being used. Yeah. Uh, things aren't exciting anymore. Somebody might say, hey, let's, you know, let's pray or let's get together. Let's, let's have this time of, of, of being in the word. They see it as a burden. They see it as a problem. Yeah. Rather yeah. than this is you, what you, you see it all the time. We're, we're Christians on a regular basis that when you get through the meal, you say, how much did we talk about God? And we talk about the church. We talk about different Christians. We talk about politics. But there was no burning, you know, yeah. just what are we doing? How can we work together? And who do we need to pray for? And, and yeah. just being in the game. There's a sense of sitting on the sideline. And quite frankly, only about 1% of us are sharing our faith. Do you know that? Hmm. Only about 1% of us are sharing this faith. These are hard numbers. Yes. Here's, here's a better number, way better number. Do you know that? Over 80% of the unchurched, now about 90% of the church of, of, of America is unchurched, okay? Uh, over 80% of the unchurched know the world's out of control. These are hard statistics. They're on our website. They know the world's out of control. They would like to believe there's a God. They want to believe there's a God. Mm. They want to believe. They're looking for somebody to tell them. And get this. They already have at least one Christian in their life that they trust. Do you realize we could, we could ignite America's revival in about 30 days if we wanted to? Yeah. But only 1% of it. It is literally the fields are white for harvest. They are. They're champions. The best. They're frightened. Yes, they sir. want to know is there a God? And we're walking around keeping it under the bushel basket. That's the problem with the church today. The problem is not the world. And you can't solve these problems in Washington, no matter right. what you do. That's right. Their, their eyes are blinded. Right. The reason they're making these stupid decisions in, in, in legislature or just being people, they're, they're dumbed down. God has, has said that Satan's the ruler of this world, and he's blinded their eyes, and they can't see truth. They, they see evil as good and good as evil. We're seeing that today. That's right. Whose fault is that? Yeah. It's ours. It's ours. I'm a layman. I'm not a pastor. I'm just talking as, as one of you. We've got to get off the bench and get in the game, and we've got game. We can do this. We can, we can change Southern California. This truth right here, we really can. And the game is the gospel. They've, yeah. got, they've got all these things mm. bearing down on them, the world that wow. is. Yeah. And the, the game is the gospel. And so we all know. We've never lived at a time, uh, well, I, 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 I mean, I can't say that. I didn't. I wasn't alive during the World War II era. I would. Have, I would have thought. I would think that that would have brought much fear to a lot of people. But uh, I can't do anything about the World War II era. I wasn't there. 
but you and I are here now, and here we are so far out from COVID, and yet Lisa and I have just gone on a trip, and uh, I was shocked, I was shocked uh, to be in two European countries. Uh, one of them did not shut down, and it's, I found it interesting because this one, ch- this one country that didn't shut down w- is a country that on Sunday, all the stores are closed wow. and the churches are packed. Wow. Is that, do you, don't wow. you see the correlation wow. to this? The other country was completely shut down, terrified, terrified, suicidal. And their churches didn't open and their churches by and large stayed closed, but they were captivated by fear. But we were, we were just there. And, and both those countries are living as though COVID had never happened. But then we come back to the United States the other day and we see people, it shocked us because we had spent two weeks away and we had to come back to America to see a people group uh, self-imposed, right? There's no mask mandate right now, is there? But people terrified right now, masked up, and still living as though there's some germ walking down the street. My point is this, what has taken the place of COVID is fear. It's absolute fear. And if you don't know that, know it now. But what it means to us as believers, it's almost as though God is dangling before us this golden apple to go for it. Because when we see the culture that you and I live in, uh, it, it, this culture needs Jesus. Uh, I'm not going to say like never before, because you know, this country is 250 years old. But I'm telling you, in my lifetime... This country needs Jesus like it has never needed him before. And we have, in fact, you and I talked about this before. I love the story. Strike that, wrong word. I'm getting away from the word story. I love the account of when God told Gideon, get your guys together, a motley crew. Right, go read about Gideon. Go find some, some pottery, okay? So they go get some pots, and these grown men with these pots, they're holding pots, and God says, light torches, and put the torches inside the pots. Then go out into the dark, line yourself on the slope of the mountain toward the enemy, and when the trumpet is blown, I want you to break the pots. And these guys, who had no hope of defeating the enemy, went out there and did exactly what God had said. They broke the pots. The light on this hillside came bursting forth and the enemy began to flee in absolute terror and panic. And Barry said, you know, Corinthians tells us that we are earthen vessels, which you know, if you're a chemist or a biologist, we are. We are actually made out of dirt. And the Bible says that we hold the truth of the gospel in these earthen vessels. And so what we're encouraging you tonight to do is when, when this program tonight is over, consider yourself becoming um, a, a broken vessel that shines the light. From this time forward, each and every one of you hmm. to determine, one, imagine one time a day you're going to share Christ. How time many, out. Time out. Yes. That is one of those things we've been told forever. Forgive me. You're my yeah, pastor. Do it. Do it. You, I mean, you, I can slay, you know, it's like, but this one time a day thing is not correct. Good. Go. Do it. Do okay. it. Okay. Can I correct her? Can I it's do true. that? All I don't day, know. Can I do that? All day long. <laughs> But, I mean, it's one of these, bits, you know, find somebody today or somebody this week to share your faith with. My question is, okay, out of all the people I'm going to be with today that are going to hell, uh, how do I pick one? <laughs> <laughs> and how do I pick the right one? 
You know, I got to tell you more times than not, when I'm sharing my faith all day long, it is oftentimes the one with the, yes. with the piercing and the green hair the other the guy. whatever <laughs> that responds in tears. Isn't that true? And so we have no idea what's going on behind that facade. So that's why this is the key phrase, folks. If we could encourage you tonight to walk out tonight and say, for now until I breathe my last breath, I, I, God, I want to move everybody every day closer to Jesus. Amen. Every day, everybody, right? Move everybody every day. Do you hear me on this? We can do that, as you say. What can happen between now and Sunday? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, my goodness. I mean, it would be incredible. And we got to talk about what we can do that as a church body. How about the church that are watching us right now? We, yeah. I mean, we, we, we got game. We need to ignite. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> word, ignite. We need to ignite. Yeah, 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 use that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you talked about fear. Can I talk off about fear for just a minute? Or do you yes. go, where are you, no, where no, are you no, going? No, talk about can fear. I, can I interrupt you? Yep. Boy, I'm getting really rude. I only have... Uh, <laughs> you go. Um, <clears throat> how many of you tonight would say that you live your life by Proverbs 3.5? Trust the Lord with your whole heart. Lean not in your out. In all your ways, acknowledge him and what? He will direct your paths. Yes. You know? <clears throat> um, we have a bit of a problem with that. Yeah. I know you said it, but you don't mean it. <laughs> yeah. Um, the church today is full of scriptures that we quote, we sing, we share, and we don't live them. Mm-hmm. That's one of the most key ones. Do you trust the Lord with your whole heart? You know, the statistics tell us, that we look at several studies, so they come in us, so we know that we're talking clearly here. Over 80% of Americans, including Christians, are living in fear. They're living in fear. Over 80%, I mean, we're an exceptional church. We may, maybe it's only 75 here, but you get the point. <laughs> living in fear. We can say we're living in faith, but then, uh, you know, what's going to go on? I'm going to lose my job, and I got this health issue, and I don't know if I have my income, and is Trump going to elect it? Or I mean, the things we get, we hold up is just really important to our life. It, it, all kinds of things to be afraid of. The byline on this book here is defeat fear with effortless faith. With effortless faith. How would we like to defeat fear with effortless faith? Amen. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Well, that's what we're talking about here. You might, it's, it's a good book. You might want to buy this book on Ignatian Life. We'll be selling them out in the patio or they'll put up a QR code later on. But you defeat fear with effortless faith. You can't conjure up faith, can you? I mean, you, you got a problem, and you're gonna. And so you just, you pray and you pray, but no matter how hard you pray, you still have this doubt. Isn't that so We've been there with 50 years of this. I, I know what I'm talking about. You just, and we can get together and we can raise our voices. God, we trust you. And God's saying, I don't care about the sound of your voice. I'm looking at your hearts, and you don't trust me. You know, can I interrupt you yeah, on this? Please, this is please. church family. This is a big deal because some of you have come from from faith groups where. They have told you, uh, uh, just just get enough, just get more faith. Yeah. Just get more faith. Come on, reach down and get it. <laughs> like like it's oh, like it's incredible. you know like it's the water in a bucket, and you're just going to do the, just claim it. Yeah. Just 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 this, and they they hype it, and they hype it, and they push it, and they hype it. It's true. And yet, there's nothing substantial to that. And Barry's right. It, it's not the the, the vibrato of your prayer voice. It's not the, the uh, enthusiasm by which you... No, it's none of that. It's literally realizing... And I think the church... I think the church in the world, certainly in the West, suffers from this terribly. Oh, and that is... We seem <clears throat> to be content, okay, with people around us going to hell uh, because we don't share. If we really believe, William Booth said this, the founder of the Salvation Army. He said, if I could take uh, my, he called, he called his, his people his soldiers. He said, if I could take our, our soldiers, fellow evangelists, and suspend them over hell mm. for five minutes so <laughs> they could see it, yeah. Yeah. they would never backslide. Yeah. And you think about that. If we really believed that when a person breathes their last breath without Christ, that it's a Christless eternity, 
we would be motivated to tell people. And we wind up loving our own fear and intimidation more than that person's soul because we talk ourselves out of sharing Christ with that person. And I'll prove it to you. Instead of getting to the point, we'll dance around the point. We'll, we'll, we know the Spirit of God is speaking to share with that individual, but we'll fumble and walk up and say, do you believe in God? Yes, I do. Oh, good. And walk away. <laughs> that doesn't work. No. That's, that's not evangelism. No. And that's not moving anybody closer to Jesus. Oh, man. It's actually letting them care. And uh, sometimes, look, don't think that Barry's just talking about the person that you pass by at that store <laughs> or at that restaurant just, you know, once in a lifetime moment. It's, it includes that person, but what about your, the power that you have to share with the people that you see on a consistent basis at work or in your neighborhood? That is powerful stuff. It, it is. Um, but at the same time, right at right line, I mean, we're all, I have pastors tell me, you know, that's, for you, you're in the world, but I'm a pastor. Mm. And so I don't, I don't get to do that. And I say to they them, uh, to do you do never that. go to um, Starbucks? <laughs> That's exactly right. You, you never go to Walmart. Uh, you never get in a, in a in a in a waiting room. You know, I mean, do you, are, are you just a you just stay away from? Well, no. I do. Well, every time you do that, you're everywhere you go, you're exactly. surrounded by eighty percent of the people are, right. are, are 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 unsaved. Yeah. Even when they say they're saved, they're not saved. Yep. Even Christians in church aren't saved. They say they're <laughs> saved. So it, it's crazy. Let's go back to this trust for a moment yep. because I think Absolutely. it's pretty critical. And and you're right. People are having a problem. They say you just got to trust. It sounds so ecclesiastical. So one, I guess I go, I got to trust more. That but the work. more you try, it doesn't, you can't do that, folks. You must know that. You can't just trust yourself into trust. You can't do it. It's impossible. So how do you get to wholehearted trust? You want him to direct your steps, right? You want God to direct your steps. You have to have wholehearted trust before he'll direct your steps. Well, he can do anything. He's sovereign. He can do but you know for a fact that he's directing your steps when you have wholehearted faith, Okay. There's a lot of scriptures that play to that. Uh, James 1 talks about, I will give you what you pray for, but, but don't waver. Mm -hmm. If you waver when you're praying between faith and worrying, um, you're like a wave of the sea driven by the wind and tossed. You're, you're a double-minded man. Let not that man expect to receive anything from me. What he's basically saying is, if you're wavering, he has no obligation to answer your prayers. Do you want to pray prayers where you, where you don't know he's answering your prayers? If you're worrying tonight, that's where you are. Mm -hmm. He makes it very clear. Okay? I mean, think about that. I mean, it's crazy. So how do you get to wholehearted faith? That's, that's the issue. There's a scripture that we all know that most Christians almost act like it's not there or they quote a lot. All things work together for good. You know, we all know. The heathen know that. But do you believe it? Almost everybody here can say, well, it's not working real good for me right now. <laughs> you know, that must be for somebody else. It doesn't work for me. You have to read the whole scripture. When he said, I came to seek and save the lost, that none be lost, there's going to be a lot of folks lost. In fact, most people will be lost. Mm -hmm. and there's this thing about confessing your sins and bending your knee and accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. There's, it's, a, it's, a, it's teamwork. We come together. So he says, I promise you, this is God talking. He means it. He doesn't fool around. He promises every single one of you, I will make everything for now until you get to heaven. For those of you who are Christians, think about it. He's promised every one of us, every one of you, that he'll make everything in your life work together for good. Uh, if you do two things. It's, it's a whole, it's a, you got to read the whole, the whole right. verse, right? To those who love me, that's it. First love, right? And you love him, you do the first work. To those who love me, to those who live for my purpose. That's it. That's it. We're always looking for our purpose. Here, more of you say, I'm praying for God, so find out what God's purpose. He didn't have a purpose for you. I'm sorry, he doesn't. <laughs> he has a plan for you to fulfill his purpose. We live for one purpose to seek and save the lost. That's his purpose for you. And when you live in that, you live in the promise. Think about it. When you live in that, when you're doing that, when you live 
every day to move everybody every day closer to Jesus, he makes sure everything in your life works together for good. You can't get better than that. I mean, after John 3, 16, I don't know a better verse in the entire Bible. And we just kind of pass it off as, you know, just we quote that first part and go on and pay no attention to it. It's exactly right. I'm so glad you pointed that out because remember when Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, you guys are aware of this. Do you remember what Satan did when he was quoting the Bible. By the way, he did the same thing with, with Eve in the garden. He, he misquotes the scripture, but it's so, it's so subtle that even you have to read the verse a few times to figure out what, what, what's wrong, what's the, what's the mistake here. It's absolutely remarkable. When Satan is tempting Eve away from God, he drops a word or he'll add a word when he's trying to get Jesus to stop trusting his father in the wilderness of Judea when he was starving to death in fasting Satan drops just a word so when we say well you know all things work together for good what are you talking about literally that could be in a fortune cookie it has no power you say, Pastor Jack, how dare you say that? You're quoting the Bible. That's not the Bible. That's, you're using a third of the verse. Satan would probably use 80% of the verse. Yeah. But you said it exactly right. <clears throat> the prerequisite is to love God. Friends, listen, for all of us right now, this is a great exhortation co coming from Barry. If we decide tonight, and you can to love God. And secondly, to live according to his purposes. Listen, then why should we worry? How can we worry? I have found in my life that the early years of my Christianity, worrying was, a, was really a habit that I took over from my unbelieving life and I carried it into my Christianity. And it didn't work, it didn't go well. Because I would pray, listen, I would pray and then wonder why nothing's happening. Because I was that man in the book yeah. of James. Yeah. I was asking God, but I was wavering. I was <laughs> doubting if God would even do such a thing. Yeah. But when I love him, that's a decision you make. And I say tonight, Lord, because I love you, I want to live according to your plan, your purpose for my life. Then what happens from this moment forward is to do Proverbs 3. It's to, it's to actually enjoy. What was the subtitle? De defeat fear with effortless faith. That almost sounds crazy, but it's not. When you realize, remember, faith, it's not the faith. Just have more faith. Forget that. Don't let anybody tell you, dude, you just need more faith. No, you know what? What we need is a more clear view of God. When we see the object of our faith is not faith. Yeah. The object yeah. of our faith is God. When we yeah. see him, that's, listen, yeah. that's what Sundays and Wednesdays are for. To, to fuel you, fuel you and fill you with more knowledge of him so that your faith is growing so that you go out there more boldly to tell others because listen God will see to it that your life will be living out the purpose for which he mm. created it mm. and it's an absolutely back in the old days we would say live recklessly for Jesus because you know but that's it it you is do. it it you is you do it. live recklessly you don't Jesus. need to worry you, you do you're, you're the reckless abandon there's no fear it's freedom i gotta yeah. tell you it's freedom that's, that's when you know word. god's making everything in your life work together for good it, it immediately ends fear it's gone karen and i do not live in fear i, I don't mind saying it people say how can you say that we don't live in fear bad things happen to us a lot of bad things happen to us we don't fear it in fact, when bad things happen to us now, we don't pray about it anymore. I know the, fair, the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. I understand all those. But I also know he knows my petition before I even give them. Yeah. <laughs> and so when bad stuff comes in, we just say, you know, we're, 
okay, God, here you go again. Well, you have something to teach us or, you know, somebody's going to come in. You know, you, you have a flat tire and you're on, on your way to a big appointment. Oh, thanks a lot, God. That's, just, that's where, where are you now? I mean, God, right when I needed you, you know. And then the guy comes from AAA and he starts working your tire. He has a bad countenance. You start interchanging with him and find out his son just committed suicide the night before. And you realize what it's all about. And then you find out the meeting you're going to got canceled anyway. I mean, that's, these, these things happen. They're real life. This is, this is how life works. So when you see it, when things are going wrong in your life, let me tell you, God's up to something. And it's not wrong. And you it's, get excited. It's, it's not wrong. That's freedom. Yeah. That's freedom. I'll give you a couple of examples. I'll, I'll give you one, but, I, you know, um, I, I was in the hospital 2010. I was dying. The doctors gave up on me. We had people, and some people are here even tonight, praying and crying and whatever. Carrie and I didn't cry. <laughs> And, and he brought us through that. It's a long story. If you want to read about it, it's in, it's in the book. But, I mean, that was, that was uh, we lost our, our 49-year-old daughter. We have two daughters. And our 49-year-old daughter died on us uh, four years ago, last week. Mm. Um, kind of tough. We didn't lose our joy. And she was a prolific face sharer. The people have come to the Lord since then. You can actually go to, her, go to YouTube a Nicole McGuire celebration of life. Over 11,000 people have watched a video of a funeral. And many of them have gotten saved. Right? So, um, I'm a businessman. If I could tell you the things we've been through in business, oh my goodness. But I ended up with my, my dad passed away, his brother passed away, I ended up with the with a half brother, he never waxed a car in his life, and he was he was just <laughs> totally cantankerous. His two sons, they hated me, and they sold their half of the company to a joint venture partner. And we put together a board, and I had three board members. He had three board members, all attorneys, and then we elected a, a seventh independent board member. What I found out too late was he always bought off the seventh. The, the odd number of board members so he could control one, it. One, and I found out the next morning he's going to throw me out of my company. All right. mm -hmm. uh, I was 65 years old. Uh, my income was gone. I hadn't prepared for retirement at that, at that point. Um, my reputation, you know, my testimony. There's Barry McGuire, the Christian. He just lost his company. Where's his God now? Mm -hmm. That's what I was facing that night, okay? You know what I prayed? I almost didn't pray, uh, but I did pray. I said, God, this is going to be the shortest prayer of my life because I ask you for nothing. I want nothing. I love you. You're in control uh, because of two things. You know I live for your purpose. I do it every day. You know I live for your purpose, and I know you honor your word. And, and that means he's going to make it for good. I didn't know how. That's exactly right. But, but as God, I, I'm telling you, I have experience, Karen and I have experience of 50 years of living this. We know what we're talking about. That, that's what the story's in here are pretty interesting, but more importantly, there's scriptures. If you just read the scriptures in this book through 26 chapters, at the end, you're going to be jumping for joy and, and getting out there showing you that the scriptures alone will get you there. So that night, as God's listening to me right now, he, he's checking me, but that night, I, I crawled in bed. I went to sleep immediately. I didn't toss and turn. I slept all night. I never woke up. I woke up fresh, and I went to my attorney's office the next morning uh, to take that conference call, right? <laughs> uh, you got to read the book. Anyway. No, no. <laughs> Woo! No, I know. I, you got to tell them. Uh, in, in, in about eight minutes. Eight minutes. Eight it minutes. took eight minutes, and my joint venture partner was so, he was cussing me out. It was GD this and F and this and all this stuff. And I, <laughs> I broke out laughing. It was hilarious. I mean, it's fun serving God. <laughs> and, and knowing that you're living in the promise. I call it the fog. Follow the nudge. Live in the fog. Follow the nudge, live in the fog. We all know what the nudge is. Uh, Bill just found out he's got cancer. I need to call him. 
Oh, but I don't know what I got to say. I, I, I let somebody else talk to him. Mm -mm. You know, I'm sitting with an unsaved friend, and almost every time they're pouring out their heart about how bad things are. I should pray for them. Oh, but if I after that, he'll think I'm a fool, and I could lose my business or you know the sale or whatever. You walk by somebody, you see them hurting, and I should help, but I, you know, I got you know I'm busy. So all these nudges, you know what we're talking about. When you follow the nudge, you live in the fog. You live in the favor of God. Favor of God. You live in the favor. You live in the promise. I like that. Of Romans 8, 28, folks. This is real stuff. I got to tell you, this is real stuff. You want to ignite your life? That's the title of the book, Ignite Your Life. It's about, it's secondarily, let me tell you, it's secondarily about reaching the lost. I got to tell you, it is. And, and, and he tells us that in Isaiah 43, 10. Mm -hmm. There's this powerful scripture that we only found about three years ago. And we, I we think just, we have the verse. We jumped up and down when we saw this. Here, here this is. is crazy. And I, this is Isaiah now, right? 43 years. You are my witnesses, says Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know. No. Not that you may know more. He says, ultimately, this is not by trusting more, not by conjuring up more trust, not by having more prayer meetings. And sorry, I believe in prayer meetings. I don't want to mock all that. But the fact of the matter is, he says, when you're my witness, when you're living for my purpose, that you may know and believe and understand that I am God. Amen. Wow. I mean, that's just incredible. You follow what I'm saying? This is amazing. This is a life changer. It'll change every life in this room. It can change Southern California. If we, if we light this spark here and we resolve all of us, we're going to move everybody every day closer to you. We can take all the largeness of what we get from this fabulous church and give it legs and mm -hmm. take it out. He can't do it by himself. He's teaching us. We can't have more. We, there's no better church than Jack Gibbs in this church. But we're sitting around and doing nothing about it. And we can vote and we can do all this stuff. We need to get involved in the political process, all that. But the number one thing we're called to do, <laughs> share your faith, live for God's purpose. Mm. Yeah. I'm looking at this and um, I'm blown away because that statement, I am, understand that I am he. Mm. You guys know that that's what Jesus and John's gospel specifically stated, I think, seven times, the I am statements of Christ. Many of us remember a guy at Calvary Costa Mesa years back. And I love the fact that God died for our sins, not our personalities. <laughs> because the man I'm going to mention it's completely different than Barry, and it's completely different than me, than all of us. We're all different. But through the proverbial school of hard knocks, he, he learned the value of sharing Christ in places where none yeah. of us could get to in very <clears throat> unique ways. And I'm talking about Chuck Missler, if anybody yeah. remembers yeah. Well, him. He would be able to well. share Jesus in boardrooms and... <clears throat> and on, on, you know, the, the most unique situations where nobody gets into. But he learned that through very difficult, impossible times. God came through. And I think, if I remember right, he, he went bankrupt, I think, three or four times by businesses being taken out from underneath his feet. And, and, want, and, you know, having nothing. And through that process, trusting God again and, and again. And then his, then his marriage almost fell apart. And God spoke to him and said, you're the one that's destroying this marriage. You're the one that needs yeah. to yeah. put your faith in me. And one of the things that we struggle with, and I used to think it's a, it's a man's thing, but I don't think it's a man's thing anymore. I think it's an everybody's thing. And that is, well, I'll fix it. I, I think I can make it through. I can take care of this. And you probably can, but the problem is it's not going to last. It won't endure. And you're just putting a Band-Aid on something that God wants to actually either completely fix or remove from your life. 
But this God that is the I am, when Barry says, you don't need to worry, when we say, look, I grew up in a home, my mother could have gotten a master's or a doctorate degree in worrying. She was, a mas- she was amazing at it. She would literally worry about tomorrow's sun coming up. She worried about everything. And so I inherited a lot of that. And then I met Jesus, and he just began to push that out of my life. But the joy of having him in control, friends, listen, this world will throw you some pretty mean fastballs. And there's nothing fair in this life. You need to, you need to just re- wake up to that right now. There's nothing fair in this world. But God. Amen. And when he does this, when he does this uh, work in the life of those who decide to love him and to live their life for his purpose, we're not kidding when we tell you, you don't need to worry. You can literally rest your life and your concerns in his care because that Chuck Missler in a Wednesday night Bible study said something that Lisa and I, we've not forgotten in over 40 years. He said, you know, when we worry, rather than trust God, when we worry, we are assuming to ourselves a responsibility that was never intended to be ours. You think that through for a moment. The proof of that is 99% of the stuff you worry about never happens. Absolutely. We're falling for Satan's tricks to keep us bound and intimidated so that we sit silent and we don't see the marvelous work of God. But when we're worrying, we're saying, God, I don't trust you. Yeah, true. It's an offense to God. I got to tell you, it, it, it offends God. When we're worrying, it just shouts the message. I don't trust you. I got to work it out myself because I don't trust you, God. That's, that's not right. Um, we, don't, we don't get beat up. I'm sorry. I, we, another thing we hear, bless those who, who persecute you, you know? Like you're going to get, I've never been persecuted. <laughs> We've been sharing our faith every day for 50 years. We've never been persecuted. We've never got anybody mad at us. Do you know you don't get people mad at you when you tell them God loves you? If you want to put, put, put a thing in their eye and say, you know, you're going to hell, I mean, there's things you can do. But when you take the other side and you're just sharing, it doesn't take you out of your comfort zone. You just stay in your comfort zone. If we're Christians, we love on people. That's what we do. And so you just share love. You love on people. And it may, take an, it may go an inch or a mile, but whatever it is, you just flow with it. You know what? Within five minutes, people would tell you things they won't tell their best friends. It's the most amazing thing. They will open up and share things with you. I, we got split up on an airplane. And Karen, we didn't, wasn't it, but when we got split up, we said, well, we must be God's in it, you know. <laughs> it happens every time. And a young gal sat beside me, and, and she saw I had a Bible, and she asked you, Pastor, no, what are you, I'm a Christian, and I, I'm, a, I'm a businessman, but I love the Lord. She said, well, God doesn't love me very much, and uh, mm. can't love me. And I said, well, what are you talking about? And she was in a lesbian affair. And I said, you have no idea how much God loves you. And she looked at me like, there's no way. <laughs> so, I mean, you just, you Is go into busy? it. By the way, the thing, we're, we're landing. I'm praying for her as we're landing, Right. And it was just a chance. I could, we got a million stories on those things. But there's people all around you. When you love on them, the Holy Spirit confirms with them. God's already dealing with everybody. He's already dealing with them. And so when you come into any conversation, there is nothing secular, folks. I got to tell you, that's there's right. nothing in your life. Christians, hear me. There's nothing in your life that's secular. That's right. It's all spiritual. That's You're in full-time ministry. Every conversation you have is spiritual. You need to understand that. Uh, there, there's so many things to understand, but the repetitive of scripture that hits it over and over again. Um, first love, we love him first. And, and, and if you love him first, you do the first work. Then it's what's the most uh, important commandment? He says the very same thing. Love the other. Love me first, yeah. and then love your neighbor as yourself. You know, if you love your neighbor as yourself, and your labor is everybody around you, 
If you love your neighbor as yourself, you love, you're as concerned for their salvation as you are your own. In fact, you may be their only hope. Mm-hmm. So that changes everything that you do. You may say to me, and I get people say, you mean if I do that indulgence, uh, you know, I, I'm going to go to hell? No. But is that indulgence helping you lead people to Jesus, really? From the things you look at, the things you laugh at, the things you wear, the, on and on and on. So all of a sudden you start bringing everything, not because you want to be inside the law and be, you know, be legal. You just want to have the joy of knowing everything I'm doing is moving people closer to Isn't Jesus. Isn't it amazing, Barry, that that young woman knew that she was in oh, this she knew. Fav- she oh, yeah. knew. Oh, she knew. Because the Holy yeah. Spirit, oh, that's Holy Spirit. Ha- had gone yeah. before you. Yeah. Catch, capture this. There is a word salvationing. When God loves you, he's salvationing you. Think about it. He's salvationing you. The whole purpose of his love is to salvation you, to bring you to heaven. Okay? When you talk, he, he chooses to reach people through us. It's so incredible, but he chooses us amazing. To, to send his message, right? So when you're talking to people, yes, you're talking to them, but he's also salvationing people through you. That changes every conversation. You want every conversation to move that person closer to Jesus, not just by yourself, because the Holy Spirit is speaking through you and salvation everybody you're talking to. That changes life. Everything, every, everything it, all, it, all, it all changes. It's just crazy. I want to throw something out there that um, maybe somebody's feeling or sensing. Barry, that sounds great. I'm going to get right on that but I've already left the uh, trail behind me. I've got a neighbor that I've blown my witness with or I've, or family, whatever it is. Uh, what would you say to them rather than write off that neighbor or that family member that you've blown your witness with, which I, I personally believe that there's a, a powerful God-given tool in that situation, but what would you say to somebody who thinks, well, I'm going to start sharing with people tomorrow, Barry, but boy, I sure ruined my witness with with my neighbor. I've got it. You know, um, we make mistakes, uh, less and less all the time. When you go back to somebody and say, I need to talk to you because I'm convicted. I said some things to you that I I should not have said. That's it. And I want to ask your forgiveness. You melt people. People want, they don't want to be angry. (laughs) They want God, and that's showing them that God is actually active in your life, so you can actually use it as a plus, okay? Um, this thing of sharing faith, let me give you an example right quick. Um, there's so many to pull, I just, I thought one of them, I'm in a hotel, Karen and I are in a hotel, and we, we, we're racing, we're wanting to race to get to a restaurant because our friend who, if he gets there first, he'll give them his credit card, he's beat me, it's a kind of a contest between us, right? So... Uh, the Uber app wouldn't work. So I said, Carol, we got to get downstairs right quick, get outside the hotel so I can get my Uber after. He said, okay. So we go down there. It wouldn't work. So Karen says, oh, you better get that taxi. Good idea. Uh, just, you know, she keeps me organized. Okay, I need that taxi. And he said, oh, that taxi's spoken for. Uh, what's it? Who? For, with who? He said, well, there's a lady back there by the front door. It's her taxi. I look back and go, oh, okay. Well, how long will it take to get another taxi? He said, well, it's 5 o'clock. There's none here. It could take about 15 minutes. And at that point, blood started to drain from my head. I thought, oh, no, I'm in big trouble. And about that time, I hear, sir, sir. And I looked around, and it was that lady. And, and she said, sir, just go ahead and take my taxi. I said, what? She's, my husband's upstairs. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> Maybe he's having, we'll just get the next taxi. Go for it. I said, okay. So we get in the taxi and, whoa, we're thrown back in the seat. And they're skidding, spinning tires. And there's profanity from the first sentence. This guy is out of control. And he's cussing in, where are the, <laughs> do you want to go? And we're looking, and if you weren't, you know, think about sharing your faith. You might say the first time this thing stops, I'm getting out of this car, right? <laughs> but, but we just roll with it and say, okay, God, what do you want us to do? And he'll always give you a word. He'll always give you the word. Luke 12, 12, I'll always give you the words to say. And it's, it's, it, he just right on time every time. And so I said, do you know, uh, a God would like to say to you, you know, um, come unto me, all you who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
And he yells, he says, it's the same intensity of his yelling, right, Karen? He says, boy, do I need rest. <laughs> we had him. So from there to the rest of man, we're giving him scripture after scripture after scripture. And by the time we get there, he's in tears. And, and we get out. I said, I tell you what, if you'll give me where you live. Oh, he says, I need, before we got there, he's, oh, my God. He says, I need God. I need to get in church. That's, uh, God must have put you in my car. I said, yeah, I think so. So we, so we get there. So I said, tell, give me your address where you live and your cell number, and I will text you the name of a good church in your area. You can't send anybody. You, oh. you can't send people to church anymore, folks. Oh, so Only sad. 10% of churches are preaching salvation anymore. If you, 90% chance you'll send somebody to church that will be woke and take them out. You can't do that. You got to be very careful. Send them to the Jack Hibbs, real life with Jack Hibbs, right? So... Uh, he said, okay, and he, we exchanged. I said, can we pray? He said, oh, man, would you pray for me? And so here's the three wow. of us in, in the flesh of his headlights, right, in front, of the, in front of the restaurant, and people walking in and out in cars, and we're praying in tears, weeping together. It was, we talked about it afterward, how funny that was to look to people. But we were just focused. I don't remember anything else with that week, really, but I remember that moment you that just, we changed his life. Absolutely. What, and we went, Excuse me, excuse me. No, no, no. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. This is, this is important. I don't want to lose it. Think about what God had to go through. Think, think about what God had to go through. That's true. Right? Yeah. He had to stop my Uber app from working. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, he had to keep the, the gal's husband upstairs. Yeah. True. Right? He had to get that driver there at exactly the right time for us to step in the car. Right. Can you believe that? I mean, you look at what God does. He orchestrates our steps. He orchestrates the steps of others. I, I'm saying this. It was an impact on his life. I don't know where that went. I mean, you, you have your moment. You go on. But I want to tell you what it did for our lives. Mm. What do you think it did for our faith? Do you think anybody's going to challenge our faith? Do you think anybody could take our faith away from it? No way. Isaiah 43, 10, I point you as my, my uh, witness so that you will believe. And we have those all the time. And the joy keeps building and it gets so much fun. And life is somewhere, we're 80 years old and we're having the time of our lives. And it's well, just, you know, it's, it's just amazing. And, but you don't have to wait till you're 80. <laughs> you know, you can start it right now. <laughs> this, I, we can't stress enough that this is the key to your Christianity is sharing your faith. When you look at the opening moments of the book of Acts, for example, or the Gospels, <clears throat> notice that this brother in the Gospel goes and shares with his brother, or this person shares with the other. And just the organic nature of God. You jarred my memory. I have not had this thought in decades. I was, well, Lisa and I were married at the time, early. It was Newport Beach. I remember walking by the pier. We were sharing with people the gospel. It was a Saturday night. There was a, a, a I don't know what they call them today, but you, you know what a chopper gang is? With the leather jackets and the sleeveless, and these guys were huge. They were just huge, intimidating guys, and they're drinking and cussing, and they had a girl on each arm. And I had my Bible, and uh, I had this feeling of, oh man, these guys are drunk, they're mouthing off, we, I don't know what's going to happen next, we just need to walk faster, let's just walk faster, because this is kind of scary. This is kind of spooky. And um, you could tell, you know that sense of discernment where this is, this could go rad. These guys could start throwing motorcycles through windows. It's bad. I mean, they were big enough. And I got past them. And uh, a friend of ours was with us. And you mentioned <clears throat> the nudge. The nudge hit me. And the thought was this in my mind. And this is not me. Remember I've told you guys often that when God speaks to you, he'll use your voice, but he'll use words that you know are not yours. 
in your head. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And this is what was <clears throat> in my head. I died for them as I died for you. I died for you and I died for them. Yeah. And I knew exactly what that meant. And I told my buddy, I said, we have to go tell those guys yeah. the gospel. Yeah. And I walked up and I didn't know what to say. And I'm telling you guys, they were massively intimidating, huge. <laughs> and drunk. And so God had me walk up to the biggest one of them all. No, I'm serious. I walked straight up to the guy and I said, excuse me, before you kill me? No, I'm serious. God's my witness. I said, excuse me, before you kill me, I'm a Christian and I want to tell you the gospel. And the guy just goes, oh, that's funny, man. That's funny. Hey, guys, he, this guy wants to tell me the good news. Oh. So, so, so what is it? Well, I started telling him the gospel and a couple of guys were laughing and he said, shut up. Go on. Gave him the gospel. And it was so sad, but maybe not hopefully in eternity. He said, hey, listen, I have to stop you right there. He said, I, I grew up in a church setting. I, 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 know, I know the gospel but I've never lived it. And he, he, he said, you know, listen, I, I, I guarantee you, God would not want me in his heaven. So you think about right there, you're thinking the exact same thing I was thinking at that moment. Mm -hmm. This is exactly <clears throat> the people. Yes. You're exactly the person yes. that God wants in heaven. Yes. You're exactly the person. <laughs> and he goes, nope, nope. He goes, I'm going to get on this bike someday, I don't know when, and I'm just going to take this thing up to full speed, and I'm just going to roll off the back of this bike, because I know heaven would never have me. And I said, you're absolutely wrong, and I'm going to be praying that you never do that, but that you accept Christ. And I walked away, and there was a, there was a silence, there was a quiet in that, in that group, and I just walked away. And I have to tell you, there wasn't a release and a relief of, oh, I made it out alive. That never entered my mind. There was a, an, there was a bittersweet, there was an aching joy, if that makes any sense. Yeah. I, I flew over the target, so to speak. I dropped the bomb. I did the mission. But even though he didn't accept Christ... The joy was in obedience to what God had told me to do. Yeah, yeah. And I knew that mm -hmm. the way it happened, the way it, it came about was under God's control. My prayer was, and it went on for a long time, Lord, don't let that guy die like that. And I have to believe, you know, listen, God is so good. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna grab a rabbit's foot and rub it and say, oh, it's all, it all, it's, it's all good. He's fine. He's in heaven. I don't know that, but I know this. Isaiah 55, 11 says, God says, my word will never return void. Amen. It will accomplish the very thing for which I <laughs> sent it. So, so as we wrap this up, think about this for a moment. Yeah. Two absolutely opposite individuals, both in lifestyle and in body size and conduct. God engineered to, to meet up over one centrality of issue, which was the gospel, and the result is up to God. Listen, none of us are going to save anybody. He saves. He's determined already at the cross how that works. We are just to tell people who he is, and there's power in your testimony. Tell people what he's done in your life. And if you must, you can say to people at the grocery store, listen, don't think I'm crazy, but I believe God has prompted my heart to say to you, is there anything that I can pray for you for? 90% of the time, maybe higher, people are going to say, yeah, you know what? My daughter's really sick. 
When that door opens, even in your prayer, you can say, Lord, I just pray for this young man's baby girl, this daughter, and Jesus. If you died on the cross for our sins and you rose again from the dead to give us eternal life, you've got the power to heal this little girl. May May, Lord, if it be your will, by the time this man gets home from this store, that that baby be healed. We, we leave that in your care. In Jesus' name, amen. You just shared love. You just cared. You gave them the gospel, and you gave them hope, and the rest is up to God. Yeah, yeah, but what if? Leave it to God. Leave it to God. Barry, yeah. you got to wrap this up. Uh, well, we're getting close on time. So many things I'd like to say. I, I would say that when you... When you're talking to me, most of the time you don't have to get into a question of, can I pray for you, or I'm a Christian, or well, you just love on them. It's, it's real simple. Just love on them. Don't be spiritual. Just love on them. And when they realize that you're sincere, they open up. It happens quickly. Hmm. It, it, it just, it's just absolutely amazing. Secondly, stop just trying to be good people. Uh, most evangelicals today believe that being a good person is being a witness. Yep. Most actually think they can get into heaven yeah, now. A lot of people. That's by right. being a good person. Works-based. Being a good person doesn't get anybody into heaven. That's right. It, it, it's worthless. It's, it's worthless. I had a friend walk out of a, a restaurant with me a while back, and, and uh, he said, you see the guy in there cleaning the restroom? I said, yeah. He said, I gave him 20 bucks and told me he was doing a good job. I said, well, that's really wonderful. How, what, what did that accomplish? He said, well, I made him feel real good. I said, yeah, I think it made you feel real good too. Uh, but what did it do for eternity? I mean, if, if you had gone up to him and said, you know, God just prompted me to give you $20. So he just wants you to know that he loves you. Mm-hmm. Same amount of effort. We need to reprogram our mind so that we're that's thinking right. in terms of what's going on. That's right. Secondly, you have all these people you're, you have opportunity to talk to, and you only have a moment. Most, most face-sharing opportunities are momentary. There are people all around you. We have cards. You can get them free of charge. By the way, we have a website, igniteamerica.com. You go there. There's no sign-ins, no password. You can't give us money. <laughs> but it's just right into helping you understand how to share your faith. And all kinds of people besides me don't look anything like me. But, but you can order these cards, Seeking God cards. Igniteamerica.com is a website. You order these cards. So when you're talking to somebody and, and at the end you say, it sounds like you're really interested in God. Yeah, you'd like to know more? Yeah. Um, why don't you just take this card? Uh, this will tell you, I just gave you a touch. This will tell you how much God loves you. Emphasize God loves you. How much God loves you. And he wants you to spend eternity in heaven with him. And it will take them all the way from no knowledge to the sinner's prayer on one website. It's a very robust website. That thing works yeah. really, really cool. Yeah. So um, I'll give you one more quick story. Yes. yes. We're at a Cracker Barrel in uh, Springfield, Missouri. And Brandy comes up to us. And uh, uh, we ask, uh, she starts asking us for our food. And we develop a relationship. And we said to her, um, uh, we often ask our service anything we can pray for you about when we're praying for you know, if there's anything and she broke into tears and she explained that her best friend was a trucker and uh, he had just gotten a call that while he was out of state his daughter was found naked in the back end of a truck uh, unconscious hmm. and by the time he got home uh, he got to her and she died about 20 minutes later hmm. so um you know, it's like real quick, okay, God, what do, you, what do you say, what do you say? And I never give out my number, but in this case, I wrote down Barry McGuire and number. I said, would you give me my number? Uh, Karen and I lost our daughter, and there may be something that I can say to him that will comfort him. So the next morning, he called me. He says, uh, Mr. McGuire, my name is Dan, and you talked to my friend Brandy at the Cracker Barrel yesterday. I said, oh, yeah. He says, well, let me tell you, um, I'm a Christian, and my daughter's a Christian. Okay. He says, but beyond that, I'm a car guy. And, and I watched you for like 18 years, your TV show. I feel like I know you. 
And I watch you on social media and I know how you minister to people. And I even know you lost your daughter. Mm. He says, can you imagine what it meant to me when my best friend said, Barry McGuire, that you want me to call you? Can you imagine what that meant to me? I broke out laughing. I literally broke out laughing. I said, you don't need me. <laughs> Do you realize what God just did for you? I'm, I'm from California. <laughs> I pedal car wax. I know the Lord. You're from Missouri. And here we are talking to the phone right now. He said, oh, my goodness, you're right. Hmm. We developed a friendship and we helped him through his anger. Now he's sharing his faith. I talked, I talked to Dan today. He was Did in you? Otterville, Missouri. And he explained the cornfields and everything he was seeing. I said, what was your last faith-sharing experience? He said, well, the other day I was wearing my, uh, all, I need for mo- all I need in the morning is my coffee and Jesus. <laughs> That's that Hobby Lobby shirt. And, and yeah, and so, he, you know, and he's off sharing his faith, right? He, he was so bogged down in anger. And we helped him through that anger. God, if we had not lost our daughter I remember. and worked through yes. the anger in our lives, we yes. could not have helped Dan work it through the anger in his life. Yeah. Wow. So um, this is a full-time deal, folks. It can change, it can change your life. It really can. We mm-hmm. talked a little bit about how we could challenge uh, our folks and do this on a more uh, resolute basis. I don't know yeah, how we do that. We, we, would... we can just, like, real quick start even now. Uh, but I can preface it this way. So you guys, for over a year, Barry had been saying, um, Jack, you need to make your, your Sunday morning service available more quickly because I have, I have a network of people that I send it out to and, and um, it just wasn't working right or whatever the case might be. I don't understand that stuff. But um, we finally just did what he was saying. And... I don't know how long this has been now, a couple of months. Maybe. Yeah, a couple months, yeah. So at the end of my notes, if anybody gets my notes online, you, you, you can get them. You can get the notes before you come to church on Sunday and you can follow along with me, which is impossible to do. <laughs> <laughs> but True. at the end, if you notice, it says BMR. Anybody, anybody has, if you've seen, at the, the last page, it says BMR. And that's to remind me to say to all of you that um, if this sermon today is speaking to you, uh, it's going to be loaded up quickly. Grab that link and send it out to 10 or 20 people or your email blast and and get it out. I'll preach the message, but you and I will work together to get it out to more and more people. That was 100% Barry's idea. That's why it's BMR is... Barry McGuire's request. <laughs> That's what BMR means on my notes. And uh, I think the first week uh, he, we did that, there was a, we, we went from hundreds, several hundred thousand views to over a million views. So you did your job. In that same genre, uh, Barry wants to challenge the church. And, and I think this is a, is a great word. And I, you want to tell them? Go ahead. You want me to? I will. Yeah. I well, think, um, I, I, can look, you imagine if we all start moving everybody every day closer to Jesus? Can you imagine what could happen? Would that be fun? So, I mean, we, we, have, we have the greatest teacher in the world, and when he's not here, we have that sermon on Sunday, Joey. Uh, that oh, was Joel. Unbelievable. Listen. We're trained well. We have the word, but we need to go out. We need to go share it and, and do it with fun and energy and loving on people. When you, once you start doing it, it just becomes so easy. It's like breathing. Literally, we pray without ceasing because as we're, as we're walking, we're saying, should we talk to that person? <laughs> and we're not crazy. We, we have a business. You know, we have cars. We have boats. We like fun. We, it's not that you're odd. It's just that that's all temporal. That's all going to burn. You, you realize everything you're doing, to think of what you did today. What did you do today that's going to impact how you're going to live eternity? Mm. Do you know the only thing that matters 100 years from now is how many people will be in heaven because of your influence? <sighs> that's right. Think of that. The only thing that will matter when you're in eternity is how many people are, will be in heaven because of your influence. You have lots of influence. It's time to start using that influence. So we're just talking before the service about how we could possibly start 
yep. you know, getting everybody doing that and reporting back and perhaps maybe having yep. a website of some sort. So we talked about um, creating a, a, a web website location or, a, or a, either a separate website or a location on our website yeah. where we can have you, we can encourage you with the challenge to share Christ, to move someone just one step closer to Jesus, and to be able to post your experience. You can say, this is Mike, and this is what happened to me today at Costco, where I shared the Lord with this man, and his response was this, so everybody, please pray for John, you know, at Costco, or something like that, to where you can start sharing what you're doing will embolden others to do the same. This is actually an online testimony yeah. of what God is actually doing in real time. And I guess it would be something like God's, you know, God's storybook or, or story page about what right. he's doing through your life uh, among others. Yeah, and God, it can be something right. where people will adopt that to pray. They'll, yeah. they'll pick it up yeah. and run with I it. i take a step further. Um, most of you don't take notes. But I tell you what, if you take notes, you remember the sermon a whole lot better. Yes, so take notes. But also, if you take notes, if you take notes, you'll be much more prepared to share what you heard on Sunday morning yeah. that week. That's yeah, true. And, and to see how often God will use what you learn. That, you hear that wonderful message on Sunday morning, you walk out next Sunday, you can't even remember what it was. Unless you use it. That's that to right. be sets in and you'll lose it. But when you use it, it becomes part of you. So true. And I say because part of your tool chest, your, your, your armor, armory chest where it has all your armor, you just keep having it, you use it over and over. So if you'd start doing that now, resolve, starting tonight, if we may we finish with a prayer, say, every, resolve everybody, starting tonight, we move everybody every day closer to Jesus. Yeah. Come to church on Sunday, and, and you won't have a website up by then, but if you, maybe you could announce on Sunday, we start seeing these coming in. Can you imagine thousands of I mean certainly hundreds I mean and we're talking about pastors watching us on air right now they could do it themselves it's so easy to do and have people reporting in so all of a sudden you realize wow there are hundreds of people in this church that are sharing their faith and making a difference look at all that you got to get in on it and by you might call it peer pressure all of a sudden realize we're doing it and guess what when you do it once you get onto it you're going to be having the time of your life I say if you want to have the time of your life for the rest of your life just start sharing your the one thing we don't want to do the only thing in Christian we don't want to do is share our faith it would do anything to keep from sharing our faith it's so, so terrifying and it's the one thing that it's the great commission <laughs> It's everything over and over and over. He says over and over again, that's what you're called to do. And when we do it, guess what? Secondarily, it wins the loss. But what it does for you, it gives you joy. You know, when you bear fruit, I'll give you joy. Your, my joy will remain with you in Romans, um, uh, John 15, 11. I'll answer your prayers. I'll direct your steps. All that, all that comes when you do this one thing, the one thing that you don't want to do. And that starts sharing your faith. And you can start doing it out. I just say, we, we could all resolve to start moving everybody, everybody closer to you. Who knows where this might go? I mean, You seriously. know, I, I, I would say this. It's not that you don't want to do it. I do believe what I read this morning in my morning devotional time in the first chapter of the book, I Talk Back to the Devil. Strange title by A.W. Tozer. He talks about in that first chapter, the biggest problem with the church today is that he said Satan has intimidated the believer into silence. Oh, yeah. You think about that. Yeah. I read that randomly this morning, not knowing how we would do this tonight. No connection. It's not that you don't want to tell people about Jesus. You do. But that voice of that, that wicked one is so intimidating. Oh, you'll probably yeah. blow it. You, you might make it worse. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Get this. Don't, don't listen to him. He's, Satan's paralyzes. We're static. We're, we're absolutely paralyzed. Worse than that, he sterilizes. us. Satan has sterilized us so we can't reproduce ourselves. Mm. He's happy for the, us to just say there's a small group and just stay yeah. there. And that's what he's done. We're down to 1%, only 1% of sharing our faith. He has sterilized the church. 
yeah. to doing nothing. He has us exactly where he wants us yeah. to be. And, and that's we can start a move to start moving. The other that's way. unacceptable. We so we're we're gonna we're just gonna agree together as a church now mm -hmm. uh, to take the gospel to the world, mm -hmm. and don't don't think of that the person next to you is gonna do it, or that's for Jack and Barry to do, or for somebody else. We it's. In, in one of his chapters, it's a team effort. It yeah. takes a team. It's a team sport. It's a team sport. <laughs> and I like that. So let's pray together. Can we all stand? Hmm. Let's pray. Father, we're asking you, Lord, tonight <clears throat> that the, the truth that Barry has shared about announcing our king our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the one who loves us the most, the one who will never leave us or forsake us, the one who says, come to me, I will never turn you away. The one who says, repent and believe, and you shall be saved. Hmm. Lord, I pray tonight that if there's any man, woman, boy, or girl with us right now or watching right now, that they would say, Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins and I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Yes. And I ask you to wash away my sins and to put your Holy Spirit <clears throat> in my life mm -hmm. and to make me a brand new person. I, I want to start today, tonight, wherever you are in the world, I want to start this day brand new with you. Mm -hmm. The past is the past. It's gone. It's done. What it is, is what it is. But God, thank you that you are not affected by the past. You're not a God limited to the past. You are the forever God. And we are your forever family. And so, Father, we pray right now. And, Lord, we, uh, we by no means do we want to come across as, as in a wrong way calling these people to share. We come across, Lord, with exhortation. Yes. To say, God, move by the power of your spirit, open up the moment of opportunity starting tonight or tomorrow and every day after this, that we will know and that we would present ourselves daily to say, Lord, here I am. Use me. What are we doing today, Jesus? What do you want to do? Whatever it is you want to do, Lord, do it with me. Every single one of us can pray that prayer. Mm -hmm. And so, God, I do pray that it would be the prayer of our hearts. Lord, I personally want to thank you for saving Barry and Karen McGuire. Lord, the, the people that you have used in their lifetime to encourage them, that they're still standing today. I think of their good friend, Dr. James Dobson, and so many others. Lord, he touches people. They touch people that we would never touch, never get the chance. Lord, in their 80s, I can't believe it. Keep them going. And Lord God, keep them healthy. Bless their family. Bless their grandkids. Bless their children. Father God, we pray that you'd bless, Lord, his business. And Father, what a beautiful testimony it is. That what many people want out of life thinks, think that Barry and Karen have achieved that. Little do they know. But they know now, I guess, that they put Jesus first in all this and all that you've done has been very, very secondary at best with the things of this world. Spoil them. Show them your affection. Bless their love, their life. And no weapon formed against them, Lord, shall it never prosper, yes. ever. Yes. And so, Lord God, we just thank you for tonight. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, yes. amen. amen. Listen, it's amen. late, so don't forget your kids. It's late. And Barry's going to be in the foyer at the book table. So he's going to make his way there. God bless you guys. We'll see you Sunday.